I'm a journalist by profession, and, and I used to write a lot. And then I went to a lot of, uh, of plays. There was, there was a tremendous amount of black theater going on in New York at that time. And, uh, and I would, would go to these plays, and I would write about them. And of course, I'm a very political person. Rohn said that the past is a bet that your father's placed that you must now cover. And I, when I talk about it, I kind of reword it a little bit. I say the past is a bet that our ancestors placed that we, that we must now cover. Say in the 60s, late 60s, 70s, and early 80s, I was in New, York, in New York City, in Harlem, and there was a tremendous surge of black culture happening then, in theater, in dance, in music. I mean, it was a tremendous amount of activities going on. The cold-blooded assassinations of Malcolm X, February 21st, 1965, Martin Luther King Jr., April 4th, 1968, and Medgar Evers, June 12, 1963, were a devastating blow that forever altered the course and shape of the human rights and civil rights movements in the United States. Before we start the program, though, in the African tradition, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, two individuals who are going to do uh, a libation uh, ceremony, and, uh, and then I'll be back. They are Ni Sowala and his wife, Dr. A. Yoka. So voila, with the uh, libation and the traditional prayer. Thank you. Amen, as you may. Menachi Hall, Nima Hall, Nama Hall, 
Hey, what is today's day? What, uh, what is today? The Saturday. The, uh, the Saturday of our ancestors, be they female and be they male. And 26th of September. Hey, Obama, whoa. Hey, Obama, whoa. Hey, Obama, whoa. When Oui, ça, c'est ça. Gon ti ou fin a fende yi. Ou fende ou an fin. Ko be ba be yi. Ko ye dana yo. When you tie nobody on ties. When you when you say ye, nobody say nay. Your ye is ye, your nay is nay. Hey, yes, a war. That we are pouring to show that you are the only one that is to be worshipped. Hey, Tiata, we pour it to show that we are worshipping you. And as we put it, we know that you've allowed all your angels, archangels, and our ancestors to come close now to partake in the in the sharing of this dream. We do that as a turn of generation. Yeah. 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 Oh, uh, 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 our ancestors, angels and archangels. Let them all come and help us to go safe and come back sound yeah. for them all to partake in what we are doing. We have been waiting you. We are unreal. you. Hey, boy, my work play. Now you know, as a black race, way down from Africa, down to this place, our struggle, our fight from north to south, is to west, heaven, earth. And we are doing everything. Yeah. Now breathe your, your, your breath. Of power, knowledge, yeah. and wisdom into us yeah. that we do this fight very, very well. Yeah. Hey, Tata, we do it without tiring, and I will make sure that we win. Oh, brother, uh, brother Peter Bailey, now it's coming uh, to come and lead and to come and uh, uh, guide uh, uh, and, and lead us into the future by giving us knowledge and wisdom about what to do, when to do, and yeah. how to do it. Hey, Tata, bless him. Yeah. There's the uh, African, African American Cultural Center. Yeah. Now, whatever is going to be uh, done there should be okay from the beginning to the end. Yeah. Should that be not so good that we can see, that we can hear, that we can smell? We call upon you and all ancestors now to, to make sure that those kind of not so good things are all taken away from us. Yeah. Bless from east, blessing from yeah. the west, yeah. blessing from the south. Yeah. Bless each and everyone who is coming there. And that COVID-19, when whoever goes to that place, we thank you that we clean that place, you swept that place clean. Yeah. We thank you very much. We know that we, our thoughts shall never be in vain. Yeah. For whatever we thought of in our minds, in our hearts, in everything, you will make it come to pass. Yeah. We thank you very much. Yeah. Over my work from East blessing, yeah. West blessing, yeah. North blessing, yeah. South blessing. Yeah. You are the hub around which everything works. Give us success yeah. in everything. Yeah. We say, cha, cha, cha. Oh my yeah, yeah. yeah, that will be done. That will be done. That will be done. Amen. We finish. <laughs> Good afternoon again. Uh, my name again is uh, Joseph Matthews and I am the president of the African American Cultural Society Incorporated, also known as AACS. Today we are continuing in our speaker series by presenting an afternoon with A. Peter Bailey. Mr. Bailey is a renowned lecturer, activist, and author. The program is being presented by AACS and also in collaboration and support from the Florida Humanities Council. The pandemic has changed our direction, causing us to produce a virtual program. Our speaker, Mr. Bailey, will be located remotely in the D.C. area, and I am here, along with the moderator and the technical staff, located here in Palm Coast, in our beautiful facility. Sit back, relax, and enjoy an afternoon with a Peter Bailey. At this time, I want to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, and the one only, Dr. Headley White. Dr. Headley White holds a bachelor's degree in criminal justice and a master in applied social science 
from Florida A&M University. He also holds a Master of Education in Exceptional Student Education, which covers specialties in autism, spectrum disorder, from Florida State University. He wrote and successfully defended his unpublished dissertation, The Effects of the Segregation on Gladstone County Public School Systems, 1968 through 1972. This was, this was uh, presented in 2006. Dr. White is a former middle and high school instructor of social studies in three Florida counties, Broward, Gladstone, and Miami-Dade, and has taught in several stints, either as an adjunct or assistant professor at Florida A&M University, where he was an adjunct, Florida Memorial University, where he was also an adjunct, and Florida State University, again, as an adjunct, and Thomas University, where he was assistant professor of education, as well as an advisor to Kappa Delta Pi Education Honor Society. He was an associate instructor in social science education in the School of Education in the College of Education at Bethune Cookman University. He has presented at the Florida Reading Association Conference, the National Council for the Social Studies, and the International Society for the Social Studies. He is a member of the National Middle School Association National Council for the Social Studies. He is also a member of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, the Pi Lambda Theta uh, chapter. He is married to Carissa, White, and they from that union has two sons, Henson and Houston. At this time, I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Hadley J. White. Thank you. President Matthews, thank you for the marvelous introduction. Good afternoon once again. I am your moderator, Dr. Hedley White. Welcome to an afternoon with A. Peter Bailey. It is my pleasure to introduce Brother Edward H. Brown, Jr., the leader of the Black Studies Group and the coordinator of the Pan-African Federalist Movement of North America. A little background on Brother Brown. He is a native New Yorker born in Harlem during the heyday of Adam Clayton Powell and Malcolm X. After matriculating from high school, he attended Syracuse University where he was a student activist and was a founding member of the Student African American Society, was instrumental in getting the Martin Luther King Memorial Library and also the African American Studies Department. After graduation, he worked for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. He returned back to Syracuse University where he earned a master's in public administration from the university's Maxwell School. Brother Brown was an activist. He presented at several conferences and wrote papers. One of his papers, United Africa by 2020, became the impetus for a book that he published called Pan-African 2020, published in 2012. Brother Brown was also a professor of African, Africana Studies at the University of Albany. He designed and taught undergraduate course called Leadership in the Black Community and lectured on Pan-Africanism at the graduate level. Ladies and gentlemen, Brother Edward H. Brown. Thank you, Dr. Headley, for those kind words of introduction. Good afternoon. I have been assigned the awesome task and weighty responsibility of introducing this, Af this, this afternoon's distinguished guests. I am doing so in my capacity as chair of the African American Cultural Society's Black Study Group. 
For more than 30 years, the study group has been studying the history, culture, and current affairs of people of African ancestry on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Under the leadership of its creator, Robert Brooks, who chaired the study group for more than two decades, it was one of the key groups that initiated the founding of the African American Cultural Society of Palm Coast in 1991. This afternoon's speaker is the second in a series that we began in January with the acclaimed international human rights attorney, Lennox S. Hines, who defended Angela Davis, Nelson Mandela, and many others. A. Peter Bailey was originally scheduled to speak in person at our fully owned facility on Saturday, April 25th, 2020. This was prior to the intervention of the COVID-19. This afternoon program also lists me as the coordinator of the Pan-African Federalist Movement, PAFMs, in North America, specifically United States and Canada. And it is in this capacity that I first met our speaker, A. Peter Bailey, in person, though I was aware of his reputation and legacy for many years before. Peter Bailey was an early consultant and one of the original members of the Pan-African Federalist Movement when it was founded in 2015. The mission of the PAFM is to bring the United African States into political existence. And when we say United African States, we're not just talking about the 55 states on the African continent. We also include states in the Caribbean, for example, Jamaica, Haiti, and Trinidad, as well as the 50 million African people right here in the United States. Peter was on the steering committee that organized, planned and organized the North American Pan-African Federalist Conference in Washington, D.C. in May of 2018. He was also a part of the North American delegation that I led to Ghana, uh, Accra, Ghana, in December 2018 for the Pan-African uh, Federalist Movement's pre-Congress and the 60th anniversary of the celebration of the All-African People's Conference. Peter is currently serving on the steering committee for the North American Pan-African Federalist Convention that will be taking place next month on October 15th to the 19th, 2020. And he's just completed the manuscript of his new book that will provide original documentation on the activities of Malcolm X in the last 15 months of his life. And this will be the focus of, our, of his discussion topic this afternoon, Brother Malcolm's International Agenda. But before he begins, please permit me to share some quick biographical points on the life and many accomplishments of A. Peter Bailey. He was born in Columbus, Georgia on February 24th, 1938. He was raised in Tuskegee, Alabama. He was in the United States Army from 1956 to 1959. He attended Howard University until 1961. He moved to my hometown, Harlem, New York City in New York, 1962. He became a founding member of the Organization of Afro-American Unity in 1964 and editor of his newsletter, Backlash. This was the organization that Malcolm X started. He was one of the last few people to speak to Malcolm X on the day of his assassination, February 21st, 1965, just three days before Peter's 27th birthday. He served as one of the pallbearers at his funeral. From 1968 to 1976, he worked as the associate editor for Ebony Magazine. From 1975 to 1981, he served as an associate director of the Black Theater Alliance. Over the years, Peter Bailey has contributed articles to numerous publications, including but not limited, Essence, Black Enterprise, Jet, The New York Times, Negro Digest, Black World, Black Collegiate, and The Daily News. He has written a play entitled Martin, Mega, and, Mal and Malcolm that was presented in several stage forms. He wrote an autobiography of African of, of Alan Alfred Ailey, Alvin Ailey in 1995, and assisted John Hendrick Clark in editing Malcolm the Man in His Times. Bailey served as president of the New York Association for Black Journalists from 1983 to 1985. He's a member of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. He received the Lifetime Awards, Lifetime Achievement Awards from the newspaper, National Newspaper Publishers Association, the New York Association of Black Journalists. 
He currently resides in Washington, D.C., but has lectured on Malcolm X at three dozen colleges and universities. And he's taught as an adjunct professor at Hunter College, University of the District of Columbia, and Virginia Commonwealth University. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, I have the high honor and distinct privilege of introducing my dear friend and elder, elder brother, A. Peter Bailey. Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank Dr. Dr. Headley White for that uh, introduction. And I also want to thank the uh, African American Cultural Society for inviting me uh, to do this lecture uh, about a person whom I consider to be the greatest person I ever met in my life. Of course, outside of my, my father and my grandfather and everybody, but outside of my family, but the person who, who uh, taught me more than anyone else in the world and, uh, and I have benefited greatly from. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, Brother Malcolm's uh, international agenda, um, because this is what he was doing that was so incredibly important. And it also show why the, I'm going to make it clear to you as to why the U.S. intelligence agencies were very, very alarmed and angered by what he was doing uh, with his carrying out with his international agenda. Uh, I guess I should start a little bit by saying how I got involved with Brother Malcolm. Um, and, and I think it was the, the 1962, the summer of 1962, I moved to Harlem. And I moved in on a Friday night. And on a Saturday morning, uh, I got up and I decided, my roommate and I decided that rather than unpacking and everything, we were going to walk down uh, Lenox Avenue and see this Harlem that we had just moved into. Uh, and uh, I was, at that time, Lenox Avenue uh, is now called Malcolm X Boulevard. I'm hoping that it will remain that, but, but at that time it was Lenox Avenue. It was, it was on 142nd Street and Lenox Avenue. So we walked down Lenox Avenue. We got down, we planned on going to 125th Street. We got to 125th Street and we decided to go a little bit further. So we got down near 116th Street. We saw a crowd gathering. So uh, we said, you know, what's going on? And they said, Malcolm X is going to speak. Now at that time, I had heard very vaguely about Brother Malcolm. And usually it was kind of negative things. You know, he believed in violence. He hated all white people. Uh, and he advocated violence. And, and he, he hated the civil rights movement. All those kind of negative things that I had kind of vaguely mm. heard about him. So we decided, we said, let's see what he's got to say. Mm -mm, because and we got in this crowd. It was, it was a very warm uh, day, June 28th. I think it was June. I don't know the exact date, but I know it was June 1964. And he was speaking outside. He was going to be speaking from the sidewalk. So we stood there and Brother Malcolm spoke for almost three hours. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, I had, by the time he finished, I was a Malcolmite because I had never heard anyone in my life, I was 24 years old at the time, I had never heard anyone tell the truth uh, as far as I was concerned about the, the nature of this society that he did that afternoon. And there were two things that I especially remember the points that he made. One, he said that this whole idea that white supremacy, the whole thing about white supremacy is just based in the former Confederate States of America is, is completely wrong. He said it is, a, it is active in, in throughout this entire country with varying degrees of intensity, but it is all over the country. It's not just in the former Confederate States. Uh, now, I kind of heard that vaguely before, so that was not, I, I, I liked the way he presented it. But then the next thing he did that I had never heard anyone in my life talk about before, and that was the attacks on the mind. He talked as much about attacks on the mind as he did about physical attacks. And to me, that was completely new. I had never heard anyone talk about, you know, and I, then I started thinking back growing up, I grew up in Tuskegee, Alabama, how you call somebody black, you better be ready to fight. You know, you better be ready to fight. You call somebody black. You call somebody African, you better be ready to fight. Because Africa to us was tars and movies. I remember as a child between ages about six and 13, we would, we would go to these movies in downtown segregated movie theaters in Tuskegee. They didn't have like uh, what black folks said in the balcony. They had two completely separate movie theaters side by side, one for white folks and one for black folks. So we would go to the theater for the black kids on Saturdays from about 10 in the morning to about three in the afternoon. We'd see all these movies. And many, many times it was Tarzan movies. 
And we sit there and that movie with theater full of black youngsters cheering for Tarzan and Cheetah over the Africans. And when, and, of course, the, and when the Africans spoke to each other, of course, they spoke in their own languages. That to us, that meant that they were ignorant and couldn't speak English. So we laughed at them. So if you call anybody black or you call anybody African when I was growing up in Tuskegee, you better be ready to fight because that was an invitation to fight. And so when I heard Brother Malcolm talk about attacks on the mind, I thought about that. I thought about all those things I'd heard about how black people talk about somebody having good hair, you know, and, 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 and she's dark but pretty. And all of those kind of psychological things that I had heard uh, throughout my throughout my life, but I had never uh, regarded them, in, let's say, in terms of, of what he called it, psychological warfare. That was something that I had never heard before. And uh, it really opened my mind to a tremendous amount of it. And it's been absolutely invaluable to me uh, as I learned to deal with the society. So I became a strong Malcolmite then. And, uh, and I was supported from afar because I had no desire to become a member of the Nation of Islam at that time, so I followed from a distance. And then in December of 1983, a friend who, uh, who I had met uh, on the job, at that time I was working for Time Life in the editorial reference department. And, uh, and uh, then there was a friend I had met, she was working for NBC, one of the first black interns at, N at NBC. This was in 1960, uh, in, in late fall and, and winter 1963. So we, had, we would have dinner there a lot and talk a lot about civil rights and that kind of thing. And, and then one day she said to me, uh, would you like to be a part of the founding of a new black nationalist organization? I said to myself, a black with her? Because I always, I always tease her. I said, you know, you always look to me like, you know, Miss AKA. I looked before you as a real. <laughs> so I was surprised that you said something about being a member of a founding of a new black nationalism organization. So uh, she said, I would call you on Saturday morning to where to meet and where to ask them questions. So uh, I did. She called me Saturday morning and told me where to go. And I went there. And when I walked into the room, I saw people like Dr. John Henry Clark and John Oliver Killers, the author. And then, of course, my friend Lynn Shiflett. And I saw Mary Fielders, who was a roommate, a new roommate. And then there were about eight or nine other people that I didn't know. I had never seen them before. I did not know Dr. Clark at the time. I had heard about him and I'd heard him speak a couple of times, but I did not know him. And uh, so we sat around, everybody just kind of talked and just themselves and talked. And uh, after I'd been there maybe about 20 minutes or so, in walked Brother Malcolm. Now, until he walked through that door, I had no idea that I was going to be part of a new organization with Brother Malcolm. And when he walked through that door, I almost fell off my chair. I could not believe it. And he came in and sat down at the table. We were at like a, a conference-like table. And we began to talk. And he started telling us what we had planned. We introduced ourselves. And, and we talked about this new organization. He told us right away that the organization was going to be called the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And it's going to be named after the Organization of African Unity, which had been founded in 1963, had its first meeting in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia in 1963. And, uh, and we, we, we were going to be the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which from the very beginning showed you that it had a Pan-Africanist. There was a Pan-Africanist concept to the, to the organization. And, uh, and he told us that, you know, that he was going to be traveling quite a bit uh, over the next few months, but that we should, you know, begin to get things, you know, formated with the organization, which is what we did. The organization was formally announced on June 28, 1964. Uh, it was officially announced as the as a new organization. But we've been meeting each other since January, and I was I became editor of the organization's newsletter. At that time, I had no journalistic. Uh, I barely knew what a journalist was. I, I mean, I read, read, did a lot of reading, but I never thought of people I was reading as journalists. I just didn't know they were working for the newspapers and everything. And and when we would, when we would, as we began to meet and began to talk about different different committees in the organization, you know, the youth committee, the education committee, the economics committee, the political committee, the you know different. And and then that was the one of the newsletter. Brother Malcolm one of the newsletter, and nobody volunteers to do that, so I volunteered to do the newsletter. I said, well, you know, since I like to read a lot and I, you know, I, I, course, I did very well in courses, you know, that require like research and that kind of thing. I think I could do this newsletter. Now at that time, I, as I said before, I had no journalism at all. And so I began, that's how I became editor of our newsletter. Uh, the first three issues were called the OAAU newsletter. And then after that, we called it the Blacklash. And we called it that because there was a lot of talk at that time about a white backlash. And so we decided to call our organization the Black Lash. And, um, and we were the one publication that was publishing 
of what Brother Malcolm was doing internationally. All the news releases and documents and things that he that he uh, was was dealing with, we were publishing in our newsletter. We were the only ones doing that at that time, at least openly. Of course, the FBI and all those things were probably doing, we were also covering it. But uh, uh, as editor of the newsletter, uh, I learned how Brother Malcolm was about you know teaching. That's why I always call him now the master teacher. In the very first issue of the newsletter. Uh, I wrote my first article about the, <clears throat> the 1964 uprising in Harlem when this officer shot this young 15 year old black boy and killed him. And they had an uprising in Harlem around that. So I wrote an article, my first article in the news that was about that. And I and Brother Malcolm at the time was, was in Africa, was traveling in Africa. And uh, he would call back to the office to get information from us about what was going on, you know, with, with what was happening out there. and. Uh, when it was my turn to speak to him, uh, I told him that I you know, that I had written this article. He wanted me to read it to him. So I was I was reading it. And then I said, eyewitnesses to the murder. And Brother Malcolm stopped me. He said, no, Brother Peter, you can't use the word murder. Because murder and murderer are legal terms. And you can only use that term uh, uh, after he's been convicted. And we know he's not going to be convicted. He said, so he can then sue you for defamation. Uh, uh, and, and those kind of things, if you use the word, he said, call him a killer and refer to it as a killing because he's a killer and it's a killing no matter what the circumstances. And uh, that was my, that was, that to me was like learning from the master teacher. So this friend and I, who was the, he did the production side of the publication, I did the editorial side, he did the production side. We sat down and went through and we had, we had already run off about 600 copies of the darn thing. So rather than rerun it, we, we just scratched out the word. Uh, uh, murder and wrote killing at the top and uh, and then distributed like that <laughs> with the word killer written at the top and uh, but but that was a very valuable lesson I learned about words and it stayed with me throughout my entire journalistic career which is why I've never been nobody's ever been able to catch me for something that said I knew how to say something and but that said so you could be then sued for libel or defamation and that kind of thing but I learned that was the first lesson that I learned directly from Brother Malcolm, where he was talking to me directly. And, uh, and then it went on and, you know, we did it. And then, of course, in, uh, Brother Malcolm was traveling to Africa for much of the time in the organization. And uh, as I said before, in June 1964, it was publicly announced. And then, of course, in February 1965, uh, you know, he was assassinated. I was in the Audubon Ballroom that day. Since that's not the topic for the day, I won't go into a lot of details except that I was there. And uh, it was the most horrific uh, afternoon of my life, and uh, I ended up being a pallbearer uh, at his funeral, and I was one of the last four or five people to speak with him that Sunday uh, of the assassination because he had asked me to come back. Say, oh, this, yeah, this is something else I need to tell because it shows you again the uh, the, the real personal brother Malcolm. On the day before the assassination, February the twentieth, I had written a news release that was going to be distributed the next day at the rally on February 21st. And to this day, I don't know exactly what I put in it, but Brother Malcolm was came by the, our, our offices that day in the Hotel Teresa in Harlem. And uh, I showed him a copy of what I had written. And, when, and again, he said, Brother Peter, I wish you would not distribute this. So I said, okay. I put him off to the side. Run off. I'd already again run off about five or six hundred dollars. I put him to the side and then distribute. So when he came the next day when he came to the Audubon Ballroom, where we, we, he was going to be speaking, I was already there when he came in. And he saw me, he said, Brother Peter, when you get a chance, come backstage, I'd like to talk to you. So I said, okay. And about five or six minutes later, I went backstage. And uh, now this brother is under all this pressure. His home had been firebombed the week before. He had been banned the week before that. And then all the things that were going on, and he was under all this pressure. But you know why he, he called me backstage that day? He said, I know you put a lot of work in the news, the, uh, the press release that you wrote yesterday. I hope you understood why I asked you to not distribute it. He was concerned about my feelings. Concerned about my feelings. Under all this pressure that the brother was under. And I always remembered that, man. And I told him, I said, no, I understood. I said, you know, you, you told me once before about, about, about that kind of thing. And, and I understood. I, I, I just put him off to the side. Uh, you know, they disappeared. I don't know whatever happened to them. Those, those, we had about five minutes. I don't know where the FBI got whoever to, but they were one 
when I finally went back to the OAU office, maybe a couple of weeks later, I couldn't find a single one of them, of that particular newsletter. But uh, but that just, that's to give you that just to show the kind of person he was, uh, and to give you an idea of, of why those of us who were supporting him, why we felt so strongly about him. So through the years, I have I have uh, been a part of any efforts you know, to keep uh, Brother Malcolm's uh, legacy alive. Not you know, those bunch of us have been doing this for the OAU members and other people joining us. We were determined that he was not going to be written off and just forgotten like they try to do with, uh, with people. So uh, we did all, we always had something on his birthday. We always, on May 19, we always had some kind of commemoration on uh, February the 21st. And, uh, and we did this consistently. And uh, then in uh, uh, 19, a couple of years ago it was, I wrote a memoir in 2013 about the, the whole experience of working with Brother called Witnessing Brother Malcolm X, The Master Teacher. That was the name of the memoir that I wrote. And uh, and then I began to think about doing something uh, maybe a year or so ago, a couple, maybe a couple of years ago. I said, I want to write something about, about Brother Malcolm's international agenda, what he was doing internationally. And because uh, I had traveled, you know, I'd been to Africa and I'd met people who had, you know, who knew of him and who heard about him, who wanted me to talk about him, you know, knowing him, that kind of thing to them. And so I said, you know, because this, although it's been, there have been several books where his international has been a part of the book, but there's never been one where he was going to focus solely on what he was doing internationally. And that's, so I decided to write a book like that. And one of the things that I came across as I was getting, getting ready to do this project, uh, I was reading this uh, book by this guy named Anthony Summers, uh, which, which was a book called Official and Confidential, The Secret Life of Diego Hoover, or something like that, was the name of the book. And I was reading the book, and I came across a quote. This book is about 500 pages. There's one mention of Brother Malcolm in this book, just one. And, and he, he talks about Dr. King's several mentions, but Brother Malcolm's only one mention in this big book. But what he said to me was extremely important. And he quotes Diego Hoover as saying, now, he said that when, when Diego Hoover did this, Lyndon Johnson was president, which means that it had to be before 1960, because Lyndon Johnson became vice president in 1960. So he he, he said that Hoover Hoover went to have a have a uh, a luncheon meeting with 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 then Senator Lyndon Johnson, who's a senator from Texas, and he he quotes Hoover as saying to Johnson, "We wouldn't have any problem. We wouldn't have any problem if we could get those two guys fighting." And we could get them to kill one another off. End of quote. Those two guys were Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. And that's the only mention of Brother Malcolm, as I said, in, in this book. And 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 when I read that, that made me say, wait a minute, you know, I need to find out more. I, I had gotten the FBI files, a friend of mine, I did not have the patience to get them, but a friend of mine had 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 gone through all the tap dance they made you go through to get the FBI files on the OEAU. So I had those. So that's when I decided that I was going to do a book on Brother Malcolm, the international agenda. And I and I when I met Brother Masada, I told him about it and that's how we ended up connecting up and he might be invited to talk to you about his international agenda. Uh, before I get into the actual agenda itself, I give a little bit about that time. That period 1955-1965 was the height of the so-called Cold War between the United States and Russia. I used to, I don't say Soviet Union, I say Russia, because that's what it really was. So that was that was that 55, 1955, 1965 was the height of the so-called Cold War. These two, they were battling each other right and left, especially from a propaganda perspective. They were not having, you know, active physical fighting each other, but they were involved in a tremendous uh, propaganda war with each other. And of course the Russians were using the uh, the racism and white supremacy in this country as part of their propaganda, telling the world, you know, especially the, the newly emerging countries in, in Africa, Latin America, uh, Asia, that, you know, y'all don't want to be, you know, dealing with these folks, because these folks, you know, uh, uh, hate, uh, 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 are put down, or uh, have no use uh, for, for, for people of color, and especially black folks. This is when in African countries, so, so uh, this this was a, a major. Now, the civil rights organization would not admit it, but they were they were also 
using that as part of their agenda. They, they would not come out and say it like Brother Malcolm did. So Brother Malcolm saw that this is an opportunity to put some pressure on the United States government to do something about what was going on in this country between that period of time. But there were some vicious things going on. People being beaten, the firebombing of, uh, of, uh, of those little girls in, uh, in, in cell, I mean, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in uh, Birmingham, uh, the, 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 the water, they're putting the water on the youngsters. I mean, there were some horrific things going on in the United States during that time. And, and the United States basically in its history had never had to answer for that kind of stuff internationally because of the, of the nature of communications and everything. But this time, because you had the United Nations there. And Brother Malcolm began to see that this was an opportunity. And as I said before, although the civil rights organizations did not say this straightforward, they were also kind of, you know, you got you to look out for this because you can't do this because, you know, people are hurting us abroad, blah, 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 blah. So they were, kind of, they were but not directly with Brother Malcolm did. And so what I'm going to begin with is, is uh, just read to you a part of, what, of something that Brother Malcolm in 19... 64 in May of 1964, Brother Malcolm traveled in Africa for an extensive period of time. And during that period of time, he had audiences. Now, remember, folks, I'm not talking about you go to a reception and you meet somebody, you shake their hand, you say, how you doing? You talk, maybe then you move on. He had audiences, which means private meetings of ranging from one and one half hours to three hours with the following president. Nasser of Egypt, President Nkrumah of Ghana, President Ezekwe of Nigeria, President Kenyatta of Kenya, President Touré of Guinea, uh, President Nyeri of Tanzania, and Prime Minister Oboto of Uganda. These, these, they were basically treating Brother Malcolm like he was a foreign minister or the Secretary of State for Black folks to, the, to, to, uh, to Africa. And this was incredible. And, and, and besides that, he was speaking at universities. He was talking to thousands of African students in West and Central Africa at, at different universities. So, and, and this was all part of his agenda. Uh, he had formed the, o, the OAAU. One of, its, one of the things about the OAAU, that was, was, its goal was to take the United States government before the UN Commission on Human Rights for being either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of black people. Now, unfortunately, at the UN, in order to do this, take it to the UN Charter of Human Rights, uh, because the United States, and I don't think they've done it to this very day, y'all, they had not signed the UN Declaration of Human Rights. They definitely had not signed it then, and I don't think they've signed it to this day, because if you sign it, then an individual or an organization can go to the UN. If you don't sign it, you have to get a UN member to take your case to the UN. So at that time, of course, the United States had not signed the Declaration of Human Rights. So Brother Malcolm could not go to the UN himself and make a case. He had to get UN members to make the case for him. So at that, and, and Brother Malcolm, of course, was looking upon the use regarding the African countries as being a way to do this. So in, in, in 1964, in May 1964, when he was trapped, you know, when he was, when he, uh, as he, he went around and met, as I said, these African leaders had audiences with them, talked to them, talked about, uh, you know, Pan-Africanism with them. Uh, they had had the first OAU, Organization of African Unity meeting in Addis Ababa in 1963. The second one was scheduled in Cairo in 1964, in July 1964. And because of what Brother Malcolm had done, he was invited to be an observer at the 1964 OEU meeting in Cairo, not as a participant, but as an observer. So he went to this meeting in 1964. And at this meeting, he presented following, and I'm just going to read excerpts from it. He presented the following statement, a memorandum, he called it, to the, to the African leaders. I'm just going to read a little bit part of it. He started, he says, their excellencies, the organization of Afro-American unity has sent me to attend this historic African summit conference as an observer to represent the interests of 22 million African Americans whose human rights are being violated daily by the racism of American imperialists. And, uh, and then he goes on to say, uh, during the past 10 years, the entire world has witnessed our men, women, and children being attacked, 
and bitten by vicious police dogs, brutally beaten by police clubs, and washed down the sewers by high pressure water hoses that would rip the clothes from our bodies and the flesh from our limbs. And then he says, the American government is either unable or unwilling to protect the lives and property of your 22 million African-American brothers and sisters who stand defenseless at the mercy of American racists who murder at will for no, rape, for no reason other than we are black and of African descent. And then he goes on to say, the, org the Organization for African Unity in cooperation with a coalition of other Negro leaders and organizations have, have decided to elevate our freedom struggle above the domestic level of cults of civil rights. We intend to internationalize it by placing it at the level of human rights. Our freedom of struggle from human dignity is no longer confined to the domestic jur jurisdiction of the United States government. Now, folks, Brother Malcolm presented that to the African leaders at this conference. I just read your part of it. It's an eight page document. He, and he, he presented, I just read you some of what he presented to them at this conference. As a result of that, as a result of him presenting that and not, and then talking to the press, talking to people who were in attendance, not, not just the leader, but talking to people who were in attendance at the conference, uh, presenting his viewpoint whenever he got an opportunity to talk to anyone who was there, you know, he would talk about what he was trying to do. As a result, the African countries did something that was unprecedented, had never been done before, and really has not been done since. The African countries issued a resolution against discrimination in the United States. And this was a direct result of what, what the groundwork Brother Malcolm had laid. And, and, I, and this, I'm gonna to read to you the entire thing, because I think it's that important. It says, the following resolution was passed at the Cairo African Summit Conference in July, 1964. Brother Malcolm ex, uh, attended the conference and urged the party, the praising, the, and urged the passing of this resolution. Now that part is what I wrote in the, in the newsletter. Here's the resolution. The title of the resolution is Racial Discrimination in the United States of America. And then it goes, the assembly of heads of state and governments in its first ordinary session in Cairo, a United Arab Republic from 12 to 12, from 12 to 21 July, 1964. Quote, recalling resolution 1904 of the General Assembly of the United Nations adopted on 20 November 1963, the declaration of the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. Recall the other resolutions of the General Assembly uh, and specialized agencies of the United Nations calling for the elimination of all forms of racial uh, uh, discrimination. As taken into account, the resolution adopted at the Conference of Heads of State and Governments in Addis Ababa in May 1963 condemning racial discrimination in all its forms in Africa and in all parts of the world. Considering that 100 years have passed since the Emancipation Proclamation was signed in the United States of America, noting with, 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 noted with satisfaction the recent en enactment of a Civil Rights Act designed to secure for, African, um, for American Negroes their basic human rights. Deeply disturbed, however, by continuing manifestations of racial bigotry and racial oppression against Negro citizens of the United States of America. One, we affirm the belief that the existence of discrimination practiced in a, in a matter of deep concern to members of the Organization of African Unity. Two, urges the government authorities in the United States of America to intensify their efforts to ensure the total elimination of all forms of discrimination based on race, color, or ethnic origin. Now folks, I'll admit that's not the most militant resolution ever done but for that time and in that situation and in that whole 1955 1965 period of time when the united states is passing itself off as the leader of the free world you know the the cradle of democracy and all of these things they're pre presenting themselves as for the african heads of state to issue a resolution like this was absolutely unprecedented and i am sure that it caused tremendous concern in the American intelligence community that Brother Malcolm had been able to get them to do this. Now, when, when we think about it now, as I said before, when you, when you listen to it now, it's, that's not the world's most 
most militant resolution, you know? But the fact that they had done anything of this type showed you that they were watching and showed you, you know, brother, the effect that Brother Malcolm was having on these African leaders and on the African people in general. And this completely up, and remember what J. Edgar Hoover said? We would, now, he said this before 1960. We wouldn't have any problem. We get those two guys fighting. We get them to kill one another. Love talking about Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. Now, this is probably, now, can you imagine what they felt like when Brother Malcolm was able to get the African heads of state to issue a resolution like this in 1964 at the, after that conference? That was almost unheard of. It had never been done before. And really, it has not been done since. It has not been done since. And I truly believe that more than anything else, that's when they start begin to say, hey, man, we got to watch this dude. This, this, this black man is serious. He's doing some things that we did not think was possible. He's being treated like a secretary of state, like a foreign minister. And he's making sure that the world is aware of things that, that is going on in this country. And like I say, brothers and sisters, he didn't have to make up nothing. He didn't have to make up something. All he could do is say what was actually going on at that time, in that 10 year period. And 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 it, it really unnerved. And, and I'm, I'm gonna read this to show you now that the FBI weren't the only ones who were working on this. This is the this is UPI. Now UPI is United Press International. They were like an international criminal of the Associated Press. And they published, you know, they would attend foreign events and then send them back to this country to print. Now this is I'm reading this. By the way, what I just read you is in the FBI files. This is this I'm, I'm reading this stuff deliberately. I have the original stuff, but I'm deliberately reading it from the FBI files so you can see how they were watching. This is also from the FBI files. And it says here that the UPI office here in Cairo sent out a report on the resolution passed by the Organization of African Unity condemning the United States on its treatment of Afro-Americans the day after it was passed. But it has been suppressed by the powers there in the States for fear it would give too much recognition and credit to the OAAU for the passage and therefore minimize the importance of the civil rights groups. You understand what they're saying? UPI, which was like the, the international equivalent of the Associated Press, did not report the passing of this resolution. And they did it because they did not want to give the OAAU which is Brother Malcolm's organization, any credit for having influences. Now, this is in the FBI files. This shows, I mean, this just gives you an idea as to what these people were doing and how they were watching. So when they try to say nowadays that, oh man, they, they, weren't, they weren't that concerned about him. You know, he they didn't, you know, even he, he wasn't, he wasn't, he wasn't, he was being, he wasn't mean, no, nobody was paying any attention to him. He was just running, you know, that kind of thing. You can see, and the FBI files tell you that they were lying. They were absolutely lying. They were very concerned about what this brother was accomplishing as he was traveling around. And I'm going to to uh, to uh, show you something else I got here. Yeah, because now that was that was in July. I remember when Brother Malcolm came back and and to to and and, and gave us kind of a you know, the OAAU and kind of gave us a rundown of what he had been doing when he was traveling to Africa. And by the way, in December of 1964, Mohammed Babu, who was at that time the, the foreign minister of Tanzania, he came and spoke at, one of, at our rally in December 1964 and was praising Brother Malcolm for what he was doing internationally and about the, you know, his Pan-Africanism. And let me tell you something else, brother, just to show you the effect that Brother Malcolm was, was having. And, uh, and after I give you this, then we'll take a slight break and then we're gonna come back. In December of 1964, the United States, England, and Belgium had invaded the Congo, sent troops into the Congo, supposedly to save the lives of these, these white uh, Catholic nuns from, 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 the, from, the, from these terrible uh, Congolese revolutionaries who were just trying to get control of that country. 
there's your truth in, you know, in there to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to stop this. When they, when they sent their troops in, there was a big debate at the UN about this, about the United States and doing this. And during that debate, the ambassador from Guinea and the ambassador from Ghana, in their presentations, both of them said, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, both of them said, if the United States feels it has the right, feels it has the right to go into the Congo to save those nuns, who's to say that we don't have the right to, to support, however we can, black people who are being killed in Mississippi and other parts of the South? They those that speeches at the UN contained that though, though, and they said that as a direct result of the groundwork that had been laid by Brother Malcolm. Until then, I don't recall any UN African UN ambassador making that connection. They made that connection, and 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 and, and according to what I, I have the article in the uh, from the um, paper New York called the New York Herald Tribune, say that Adlai Stevens, who was then the United States ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, L.A. Stevens and other, they were astounded when those two brothers made that connection. Who's to say? If the United States said they have the right to go in there to, 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 to Congo, to, who's to say that we don't have the right to however we can support those folks who are being killed by white supremacists and racists in Mississippi and the other states in the South? That was unheard of. This was because of the groundwork that have been laid by Brother Mal. And as I said before, I'm going to take a short break and then we will continue uh, with Brother Malcolm's international agenda and what he was doing and some of the, and there was some of the ways he was carrying it out. Good afternoon. At this time, we'll take a five minute break where you will learn more information about the African American Cultural Society. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, we've, uh, we've had a, a, an exciting program. Uh, we are really uh, happy with the way things are going. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have to make sure we do this cycle is to get out the vote and to uh, support uh, Black Lives Matter, and I know uh, when you people see your shirts or something uh, that says Black Lives Matter, they'll come back with this, well, all lives matter. Yes, they do, but Black Lives Matter more because of the way we're treated. If we're treated equally, then we don't have to say Black Lives Matter. We can say all lives matter. We're concerned about everything to do with uh, the violence and the things that are going on. So I want to emphasize that to get out the vote and to also uh, be concerned about what's happening in our country. I have on today a shirt that says Black Lives Matter. It has our logo, the logo of the African American Cultural Society. We're selling these shirts and we're pushing not only the shirts, but the movement and the consciousness of uh, the movement. So this shirt that I have on is uh, very nice. It uh, fits uh, all sizes uh, from medium up to triple X, double X, single X, all X's. Um, I'm not sure about how small it'll go, but the unique thing about this shirt and um, other shirts that says Black Lives Matter, there are two things that distinguish us. Our logo, which we're very proud of, and also you got the front, and you'll see me when I'm going away, from the back. So we're front and back and we're pushing these shirts. If you're interested in one, contact uh, the uh, office. Uh, 
386-447-7030. Also, uh, we'll be advertising it on our website. And you can purchase it there as well. And our website is aacsfarmcoast.org. So, thank you. Have a good afternoon. Okay, uh, thanks again uh, for uh, providing me this opportunity to talk about Brother Malcolm's international agenda. Uh, I think it's very important that our people understand what was going on, and, and especially uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, Pan-Africanism and why Pan-Africanism is so important for us to follow. I think I had, I had uh, told you about the, the, uh, the, uh, the United States, those, those two African ambassadors, so the first time, and again, now, if it had been done since uh, any any other time since then, I don't know about it. I'm not I'm not going to say that it hasn't been done. I'm just going to say if it has been, but for for those African diplomats, the ambassadors of Ghana and Guinea, to make that connection was extremely important. And and of course, as I said before, the the New York Herald Tribune newspaper said that Adlai Stevenson and other Western, uh, the United States ambassador, they were they were astounded. By the way, they made that 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 connection. Uh, again, something from the FBI files, and it says right here, on November 6, 1964, T9. Now you know the the FBI gave the informants. These this is they gave them these the way they called them T9, T8. You know this kind of thing. So they're saying here in the FBI files, it says here T9 furnished an OAAU press release dated September 1st, 1964. Uh, uh, to the press by Mal made by Malcolm X in Cairo, Egypt on August 23rd. In other words, Brother Malcolm had made a statement in, in, in Cairo on, on August 21st, 1964, and it was done as a press release on September the 1st, 1964. But this is what the FBI filed to say. This press release accused the Western powers of playing down the second African summit conference held in Cairo and described Africa as the key for the balance of power struggle between the East and West. This press release read in, read, read in part as follows, and then they include something from the release. They are, they are now quoting from the release. This is Brother Malcolm speaking. I had traveled over 6,000 miles from America to attend this African summit conference as an observer. The Organization of Afro-American Unity, which is, which is patterned after the latter, and after the letter and spirit of the Organization of African Unity has sent me to present the, the true plight and the feelings of 22 million Afro-Americans to those heads of state 
heads of independent African states. Upon my arrival in Cairo, I was met with open arms by the African leaders and their various delegations. I found no doors closed to me. You got that underlined. I found no doors closed to me. They asked me to prepare a memorandum on the real status of our people in America, explaining how we were also victimized by by neo-imperialism in its racist American form. And they urged me to present my memorandum to the conference so they could take action on it in our behalf. Now, that was, that was what I had read to you before. That Brother Malcolm, so that when he, he's not Brother Malcolm not writing in this week, because this is in the FBI files, but it is what Brother Malcolm wrote. Now I have here the actual release, and I'm going to read some, some excerpts from it to show you what Brother Malcolm, that in, 19, in September 1st, that he issued this release to try to explain to those of us here in, in, in the United States what he had done while he was at, at that conference. He said here, uh, uh, Every effort by the American press to play down one of the important and the success of the second annual summit, African Summit Conference held recently here in the ancient African city of Cairo could well be drastic mistake for the Western powers and especially for America. The entire continent in Africa and her awakening people is the richest prize yet in the key struggle for the balance of power currently being waged between East and West. Not only her unlimited supplies of untapped mineral resources, but also her strategic geographic position makes her extremely vital in the present world struggle. Going a little further, during the African American Summit, any any unbiased observer could easily see that Africa is making every effort today to stand on her to stand on her feet and speak with her own voice. Africa took Africa's Africa. Uh, seeks not only her rightful place in the sun, the degree to which the well-meaning element in the American public uh, realization that that to be independent and self-reliant is Africa's only aim will, will determine the attitude and the degree of pressure the American public will put upon their politicians at home in order to keep the, the American government foreign policy toward Africa, a policy of genuine assistance instead of the thin and disguised Benevolent colonialism, in, for, for, of, of benevolent colonialism, philanthropic imperialism. What many of the when it, what many of the more cautiously recipients of, of American uh, economic aid are beginning to label as American dollarism. Brother mm-hmm. Malcolm called called this the, the type of foreign aid uh, bribes because that's what I call them. They, that the United States was trying to offer to African countries. He called it American dollarism. And he says, uh, goes on to say further, in order to keep the organization of African-American unity from uh, gaining the interest, sympathy, and support of the independent African states in our efforts to bring the intolerable, the, the miserable plight of the 22 million Afro-Americans before the United Nations, the, the racial element in the State Department very shrewdly gave maximum, oh, maximum uh, video, world video, wide, worldwide video publicity to the recent passage of the Civil Rights Bill, which was which was uh, actually only a desperate attempt to make the African states think that she was sh- severely trying to correct the continuing injustice done to us, and thereby uh, and thereby get the African governments into permitting a, a services a permitting increase to keep the, her racism. Uh, domestic and and still within her jurisdiction because America at that time was trying to say no this is a domestic problem this is not international you know this is domestic and that was the way they were that they were trying to present the whole question of white supremacy in this country and and I, I'm going to stop there because again I just want to show you the the how concerned the the State Department the FBI and the CIA were about what Brother Malcolm was doing. Brother Malcolm, in one instance, Brother Malcolm, uh, that was an, uh, uh, someone who was giving out scholarships. He arranged for 20 African students to get scholarships to Al Azhar University in Cairo. Brother Malcolm arranged that. 20 African students to get, get scholarships to that. He, he spoke to African students. He, uh, he, uh, he, he made us, those of us here in this country, to stop looking at Africa the way we had been taught. 
to stop looking upon Africa and to stop being being felt you know humiliated or a downsize when when people called us Africans. You know, to to identify with with with, with the continent of where our ancestors had come from. And that it was not what we had seen in the movies and what we had been told in, in, in many of the textbooks, the, the history textbooks that we were taught. I mean, he was very, very, I call him a master teacher because the more, as much as anything, that's what he was, he was, he was very good at doing that. He knew he was very good at taking, uh, taking situations and, 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 and using analysis to make them clear. I remember once, and he gave, as the editor of the newsletter, and, and I, I hope you all can believe this, I had the nerve, as the editor of the newsletter, I began to bug Brother Malcolm about writing something specifically for the newsletter. Now, here can you imagine, here I am, I'm what, 20, at, at that time, I was 20, 26 by that time. And I'm bugging, I said, Brother Malcolm, you know, we've been printing your press releases, and we've been printing your, your, your memorandums, and papers that you've delivered, but we want you to write something specifically, I didn't say we, I said, I want you to write something specifically for the newsletter. And I was, I think every time I had a chance to talk to him, which was several times, I, I would say this to him, you know, on February the 20th, the day before he was assassinated, he gave me an article to publish in the next issue of the newsletter, which is going to be volume, volume one, number 10. It's going to be the 10th issue of the newsletter and uh of course you know you know after this session no the newsletter was published but in that article again he talked about the importance he told he talks about a couple of things when he talks about progress he said you know these people are constantly talking about progress and how much progress black people in this country have made and he said he said if you are if you are have a master servant relationship and the master's making a hundred dollars a week. The service living standard is going to be accordingly. He said, however, if the master start making a thousand dollars a week, some the service position may improve a little bit too. He said, but that's not progress. Progress only occurs when the master servant relationship is changed. So the fact that everybody could that's the first thing when you talk about progress because they start talking about how all the money black folks make. Uh, you know, we had this net. He said, but, but he said progress occurs when that relationship changes. That's one thing from that article. There. But the most important thing from that article, uh, again, talking about his international agenda, he said, he said that I can remember growing up in Michigan, hearing people use the term, you don't have a Chinaman's chance. Now, I remember hearing people say that as a kid growing up in Tuskegee. You don't have a Chinaman's chance. And when they were talking about whatever you were trying to do, there was no way in the world it was going to happen. You don't have a Chinaman's chance. He's what Brother Malcolm said. He said, but you know this. Since China became a force on the world scene, you don't hear nobody saying that anymore. Nobody says that anymore. He said, because China has become a protection for people of Chinese descent, no matter where they are in the world. I see, and that is exactly what the continent of Africa should become for people of African descent. She said the same, that should be the same way that people would not mess with, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, would not mess with people of African descent because a strong Africa would be a protection and make, and make people very wary about doing those kinds of things. And, and, that, and, and again, to me, that again shows his ability to to teach, to take it. See, when you hear that, you can understand very clearly. Understand whether you like a dude, you know, who 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 works cleaning the building at night, or you a PhD. That's understanding. He makes it clear. If you don't, they don't say you don't have a Chinese chance anymore. Why? Because China is now a world power. But that's what Africa can be or should be for us. Well, you know, you don't mess with you don't mess with these people in, in, in the United States because you know they're connected to the continent. You know, that's what that's what Pan Africanism is all about, and that was the kind of way that he had of teaching us. And 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 I can remember that um, uh, he he would he would tell us that that we as a people absolutely 
is dependent on a strong African continent. But he also let the Africans know that they are just as dependent on us. That the, that the key for people of African descent around the world is a strong relationship between African people on the continent and people of African descent in North America. That's the key they used to tell us to, 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 to the protection and the, and the promotion and the defense of, of people of African descent all around the world. There's a serious working relationship between, between, between uh, Af people of African in North America and people of African on the continent. And, and so that's, that's why I say that he was the, the, or a, one of the strongest Pan-Africanists. And, 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 and why those of us who, who, who believe in him, who believe in him as the master teacher, we are constantly trying to, to talk about this and, and get this, our people to understand this, that, that, that Pan-Africanism is not some kind of romantic you know, notion. Because some people say, oh man, that's just a romantic notion y'all got. You know, no, no, no. It has, a, it has a, an inspirational and a spiritual element to it. No doubt about it. A cultural element, but it also has a very practical element. A strong Africa can be a protection for people of African descent. And we have to understand that, folks. And Brother Malcolm understood those kind of things long before. I remember when I was in Ghana in 2018 at, this, at, a, at, a, at a Congress, a pre Pan Africanist Congress. Uh, uh, and, and I can remember uh, telling people that, that that Brother Malcolm position was that we 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 gotta deal with each other. We gotta work with each other. We gotta understand each other. We gotta we gotta understand that that a strong Africa is absolutely necessary. Brothers and sisters, I read a in two thousand nine supplement in the Washington Post newspaper. Now you know the Washington Post is one of the three most important newspapers in this country. They ran an eight-page supplement, and in the supplement, which I read when I was in Ghana to the people in attendance at this conference, it said, the headline of this supplement was Africa on the Agenda. Now, you notice, they didn't say Africa's agenda. The headline of this eight-page supplement was Africa on the Agenda. The subhead was Africa, the key to global economic growth. This is the subhead now. Africa, the key to global economic growth. Now, if I'm from Mars or somewhere and I see that, I see, dang, the Africans must be the baddest folks on earth. The key to global economic growth. These are the white boys saying this in the Washington Post. And then you look at what's happening. We have got to understand what Brother Malcolm understood and what he was telling us over and over and over again. The continents of Asia, Europe, and North America have many disagreements with each other on many issues. And they fight each other, call each other, but there's one thing that those three continents agree on. Africa is to be exploited. The continent of Africa is to be exploited. And we are the only ones who can stop that. We've got to, we've got to follow the things that were taught to us by Brother Malcolm, Kwame Nkuma, Julius Nyeri, you know, Patrice Lumumba, the people who, who understood that a strong Africa is an absolute necessity not some kind of romantic, uh, you know, otherworldly type of thing. It is, it is, it is, it is, it is it's absolute necessity for our very survival as a group of people in this world. If we're not going to be turning at the bottom of the pile, then that's what we got to do. Brother Malcolm was saying that over and over and over again. That's what he taught us. And believe me, our 
enemies and our opponents understand this. That's why they spend a many a time, much time and energy trying to keep a split between people on the continent and people of African descent in North America. They spend a lot of time and effort and money and 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 bribing and and, and doing all they can do to make sure that that never happens. Now, the very fact that they spend all this energy trying to stop it should tell us how absolutely important it is. If it was not that important, they would not be worried about it. They would not be worried about it. They would not have, they would not. Brother Malcolm, I, I really believe that Brother Malcolm had just stayed in the United States and talked about his program and what he was all about. They, they would have watched him and, you know, see, but they would, I don't think they would have assassinated him. They assassinated him because of what he was doing abroad and the attention that he was getting. He went to London and spoke at Oxford University. He met with leaders of African student unions at all the different universities in, you know, in England. He, he spoke in in, 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 in in so many places, man, and people listened. They listened. When I read when I read about him, said something about talk about him. So when I was in Ghana at that conference, man, they listened. And young people came to me afterwards and said, "Man, you know Malcolm X," because they had heard vaguely about him, but that I was able to talk to them with some degree about him and how strongly he. He felt toward Africa and his friend. I mean, they really, they really, I'm in, I'm in contact even today with a couple of brothers from on the continent, you know, because of that, who, who, are, who are young Pan-Africanists, you know, on the, on, on the continent today. In, uh, in one, one is in Ghana and one is in Cape Verde. You know, in a, in a, and, and so, brothers and sisters, um, I'm just going to close by saying that we need to know we must understand when we talk about uh, a relationship, we talk about Pan-Africanism, we're not just talking about it in some kind of, as I use the word again, I know I've used it before, some kind of romantic way. We're talking about a very practical, much needed thing for our very survival. Brother Malcolm understood that. He taught that to us. And you know who understood it? the United States government. And that's why they felt as though this brother is a danger to our foreign policy and what we're trying to do and all that mineral wealth that's on the African continent. We need ready access to them whenever we want it. We don't need somebody telling, you know, being some, you know, wanting the Africans to beware. Don't, don't, don't fall for American dollarism. He, the brother Malcolm talked about it like it was almost like an ideology. You know, dollarism is like an ideology. And they use dollarism to, to make their way around the world, both here in, the, in North America and on the, on the continent. And, we should, and you know what, brothers and sisters, I'm going to close with doing this. We should teach our young people that we're living, North America is a continent. This is not a country. This is the continent of North America. Now, in papers we write, we may have to use the word United States, but when it, whenever I'm writing on my own or when I'm talking to, to, to black folks, I always say the continent of North America, not the United States, because we got to get into it. This is the continent and only the continent of Africa can negotiate with the continent of North America. I tell my African colleagues, no individual African country, no country can negotiate with the continent. It is literally impossible. Only the continent of Africa can negotiate with the continent of North America. And I think we should, as I said, we should start using that in our language. And uh, when we talk about it, we should, you know, among ourselves at least, we should say that we should say the continent of North America, not the United States, continent of North America. This is a continent. And it's, that's why it's power lies. It is the only united continent. Just think about it, if this was 50 countries, like in Africa, and what they have done, 
They've got wine now. Instead of fighting independence, Africa, independence, quote unquote, if you get 10 Africans on one acre of land and they call themselves the Republic or whatever, they'll have an ambassador for Washington the next day because they want to encourage all these little, you know, little developments mm -hmm. rather than a unified continent. Well, the Malcolm taught us how to see that kind of thing. He was a master teacher. He was a master teacher. And I hope that that uh, my book that I'm working on, Brother Malcolm's International Visionary International Agenda, will be an aid in helping us to better understand the absolute importance of knowing what this brother was doing internationally and then following on it as best we can. And again, I want to thank the African American Coastal Society, Brother Insada, and everyone for inviting me to, to deliver this lecture uh, to you. And uh, I look forward to, uh, to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bailey, for that wonderful presentation. I know if you feel like I feel, you'll learn so much more from a primary source. As they say, a great library resides in the elders. At this point, we will have some questions from the audience, starting with Mr. Joe Jones, who is a member of the Black Studies Group. Mr. Jones is a former sales director and marketing director for AT&T, Lucid Technologies, and a former vice president of Electronic Processing Center. His thirst for learning the history of Africans in America became personal as he researched his own family history. He chronicled his family's history in a book entitled All I Need, which was published in 2013. Joe is happily retired and lives with his wife, Carol, here in Palm Coast, Florida. Thank you, Dr. White, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Wasn't that a fantastic presentation by Mr. Bailey? I'd also like to thank the uh, AACS for bringing Mr. Uh, Bailey before this organization. Just a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Bailey. Malcolm X presented such a serious personal persona rightfully so, but uh, he also seemed to have a very quick and infectious smile. What kind of person was he in private among friends? He, you know, I one of the things that I enjoyed is that I did have an opportunity on occasion to meet him with a very small group. He used to eat dinner at a restaurant that was not too far from where I lived. So every now and then, if he had dinner that was some of his top aides, they, they they would invite me down to come down to the dinner, and he would sit there. And, you know, he would he would he would crack jokes. Uh, sometimes, you know, I, I saw him in, in, when he was at his rallies. If you thought people not paying attention, he would say things. You know, how Baptist preachers say, "Say Amen, somebody." Uh, say Amen, somebody. He would do that do that kind of thing. You know, uh, in in the, uh, when he was talking, and because uh, he didn't have to do that very often. Because every time he was speaking, people were really paying attention to what he was saying. And then I remember that there was a, I remember in, in Jet Magazine has a great quote that he did. Uh, you know, that one of the things they were saying about the Congo situation in 1964, uh, they were trying to act as though the African re revolutionaries were actually cannibals. And they are still doing this in 1964, claiming they were cannibals. And so Brother Malcolm, when, brother, when they, somebody mentioned to Brother Malcolm, and Brother Malcolm said, and it's quoted in Jet Magazine, he said, listen, if those African brothers and sisters were cannibals, they, they would, they, 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 those, those, uh, those, those nuns who you're talking about had been in Africa for many, many, many years. He said if they were cannibals, they would have eaten them when they were young and tender. They wouldn't have waited till they got to be old. Now, you know, that sounds a little bit hard, but that's what he, that's, that's what he said. 
and he was making so I mean he was able to crack jokes like that, you know, and he was and he was a he was a relaxed person when he was doing he could say things that you know, he could say things that were funny and uh and give it talk about things. So he did have a to me he was a he was a warm person. And like I say, when he when he thought he had hurt my feelings because he asked me not to publish something in the newsletter. So he coming back to you know, to basically say, I hope you understand why I should do that. I understand you put a lot of work into. It. He was concerned about my feelings, so you know he was even if, he was a real human being. He was a real human being. He was a serious black man, but and also a real black human being. Malcolm up here is so comfortable and at peace in Africa since his parents were Garveyites. What was his position on African Americans moving there? And did he ever consider such a move for himself? Uh, again, like you say, his parents were Garveyites, uh, especially his, uh, uh, and he, I often say that I wish, and never, that wasn't the only one who said this, because he had all kinds of offers to come to Africa and to teach. And and we sometimes we we wish he had said you know I've done all I can do I've done better I'm going to get my wife and my children and I'm going to go live in, in Africa and 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 we I I to this day I've heard those of us who were there during that time sometimes we when we among ourselves you know we used to say that you know uh, he uh, he knew that he could go he would have been welcome practically anywhere in Africa in the continent at that time but he felt a responsibility. To us in this country, to people of African descent in America, and that's why he stayed. I mean, his sister Ella, sister Ella, when I was working on the book Seventh Child, a family member of Malcolm X, she was talking about how she and his and some other members of they tried to beg him to you. You've done a lot. You made a tremendous contribution. Get out of here. But he felt this felt this obligation to stay, and he did, and he knew. You know, he was not an idiot. He knew that the big big forces were after him, you know, and uh, but he made that decision. I personally wish that he had said, OK, y'all. I've, I've, here's what I've told you. I've done a lot. I'm going to but now I'm taking my wife. And at that time, he had four daughters. And she was pregnant with the, with the twins. And I'm going to be moving to Africa. I really wish that he had done that personally. And I wasn't the only one later of those who had been working with him. Uh, so. So uh, he didn't do it for one reason. He was that committed to us. He was that committed to us. That is the reason he did not do it. He had all kinds of opportunities that he could have taken, but he didn't take them because he was that committed to us. J. Hoover wrote in a 1964 memo that the organization of African-American unity was a threat to America's national security. Why would Hoover harbor such a belief? And do you believe that uh, Hoover's views hasten Malcolm's demise? Well, of course, I, I read that statement at the beginning of my presentation where Hoover said before 1960, we wouldn't have any problem if we get those two guys fighting and we get them to kill one another off. Those two guys were Brother Malcolm and Dr. King. You know, so Hoover looked upon Brother Malcolm as a real threat to, to, the, to the white supremacist system that existed in this country. There is no, I mean, that is absolutely no doubt about that. He looked upon him as a real threat to that. I have something, and also later on, when COINTELPRO, which was a counter, I think some, something about counterintelligence agency, but it was the FBI counterintelligence agency that was set up. Let me t tell you what Hoover, what they called Hoover as saying, yeah, they called Hoover as saying, uh, this is a column that I wrote on Dr. King, J. Edgar Hoover, a, a J. Edgar Hoover target. I say that in, when, when Hoover set up COINTELPRO, according to this writer, Richard Gid Powers in his book, uh, uh, here's what Hoover said for two things that COINTELPRO was set up to do. One, 
prevent the coalition of militant black nationalist groups. An effective coalition of black nationalist groups might be the first step toward a real, quote unquote, Mau Mau in America, the beginning of a true black revolution. Number two, prevent, uh, prevent the rise of a messiah who could unify and, ele and electrify the militant black nationalist movement. Malcolm X might have been such a messiah. He is the, he is the martyr of this movement today. Martin Luther King, Stokely Carmichael, and Elijah Muhammad aspire to this position. Elijah Muhammad is less of a threat because of his age. King should be a very real contender should, should he abandon his support, his supposed quote unquote obedience to white liberal doctors. Carmichael has the necessary charisma to be a real threat in this way. That's in COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And see, Hoover says Malcolm X might have been such a messiah. Mm -hmm. He knew that he was. After watching Abdul Rahman Muhammad's documentary, Who Killed Malcolm X? I came away with the distinct impression that the root cause of Malcolm's death was a fear of losing the prestige and the money that came along with the association of Muhammad Ali. What is your opinion? I think that Brother Malcolm was, there were two elements involved in the assassination of Brother Malcolm. There were elements in the nation of Islam who wanted him out of the way. And they wanted him out of the way because some of them were not, they were basically not very ethical people. I always say elements. I don't say the nation of Islam. I say elements in the nation of Islam. And they were willing collaborators with the, the FBI and, and others who wanted Brother Malcolm, you know, the governmental people who wanted Brother Malcolm out of the way. And I think that what they did was, the, the deal that was cut was as follows. If you all do it, nobody will be punished. And nobody was punished, except the only reason that I would believe the day I died that if, if Hare had gotten away, there never would have been a trial. Mm. They would have been saying, you know, uh, oh, uh, we, don't, we don't really know, we're checking. Well, you know, never, it, it would just never have been a trial. But Hare getting shot by one of the security, by the security guards and getting caught, then they had to do something real quick. So a couple of days later, they picked up these two Muslim dudes who put them in, uh, it was in the nation, put them in jail for 20 years or something they did not do. Now, these dudes were strong supporters. They were very hostile towards Brother Malcolm, but they were not part of the assassination team. The other four members of the assassination team, nothing ever happened to them. In fact, one of them just died this past April, right over there in New, New Jersey. They, 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 they did never touch them. And I think that was the deal. Nobody will be punished. And the only reason that was was a trial was because of the of the of, of, of Hale, one of the assassins getting caught. I and I and I also blame on the fact that when when they when I was called in for questioning by the New York City police and the the only thing they wanted the main thing they kept asking me was did I believe what was you know what was being said about the assassination they wanted to know what what, what, what we were accepting uh and this happened to other people what they were putting out there and we learned it from brother mountain we said well according to what you all said blah, 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 we did it like that you know but but yes they they uh they uh that was a that was a definite there was some willing collaboration between some elements in the nation of islam and uh the fbi especially Hoover. Because if you have seen by that first statement, we again we wouldn't have any problem if we get to if we get them to kill one another off. And he was those two guys with Brother Malcolm and Dr. King, and those were the two men who ended up assassinated. How did the personal relationship between you and Malcolm begin? As a journalist, why wasn't he weary or suspicious? At the time, I was a young dude. I was working in the, 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 the uh, what they call the editorial, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the bibliographical files at Time Inc. They had a company files and a bio files. I worked in the bio files. We took calls from the reporters for, you know, for files from people who they were interviewing or, or writing articles on. 
My job was to read the papers every day. If everybody's name was in the paper, I had to circle that name and put them into the files. And there were seven newspapers in New York in those days. That's what I was doing when I, you know, uh, as, as a job. And, uh, and then, of course, as I said earlier, I had, had a friend. She was working in, at NBC. And, in, 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 and that's part of what they call Rockefeller Center. Time Life Building and, and the NBC Building. NBC was all part of Rockefeller Center. And down below, they had, like, restaurants and everything. So I would eat down there. And, uh, and, and, um, and, and I met this young lady who was working, who was an intern, one of the first black interns at NBC. And we began to talk a lot. She was the one who, yeah. now I began following Brother Max, as I said earlier, when I first heard him speak in 1962. From the first time I heard him speak, I became a Malcolmite because I had never heard anybody in my life talk about race in this country with such clarity and knowledge and 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 passion and and uh or whatever i had never heard anybody talk about it like that and i became an instant and and as i said not not wanting to you know, join the nation of islam mainly because you know i was had been raised christian and i was just in the process at that time of rejecting christianity and i was not ready to go into another religion so i was like i was going through that period where i was rejecting you know the religions and uh, and so um, that's how that's how I met him, and uh, and, be, and being editor of the newsletter, you know, and and because he people forget Brother Malcolm was also a judge. Brother Malcolm wrote a column that, that that some of the black newspapers were publishing at that time. Plus, Brother Malcolm was the founder of Muhammad Speaks. He was the one who put that paper together and made it to what it was. So he 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 had journalistic. You know, he was he was kind of a journalist also, but among the other things, and uh, and uh, and that's, so that's how that's how I met him. And uh, but I became like a. It was only it was after that that was in 1965 assassinated. I I became an active journalist. Uh, well, I'm not going to say active journalist. I became uh, part of the staff of a major publication in 1968 when I was taken on the staff of Ebony Magazine. I was I became on the staff of Ebony Magazine. But Brother Malcolm was the reason that I became a journalist, that, that, that I became a journalist. If Malcolm's agenda had been successful in America, what would America look like today? Did he really believe that the races had to be separated or that they could be separated? What would that separation look like? Brother Malcolm believed that black people in this country should be a serious, self-sufficient, uh, economic, political, and cultural group. Now, then what happened, you know, that was that. But we should be a strong, cohesive group of people who were not economically dependent on everybody else who politically voted for our interests. We had a political party. We didn't have to be Republicans or Democrats. We could have an independent political party that would, that would support any particular issue that was a uh, part of our agenda. It was looking out for us. And, and culturally, we would have our own. We, we we were a major cultural force, and we should have we should have promoted that, and followed that, and, and developed that. All of as a we were a, we were a group of people, and we had a, we had a we could have had an economic situation, a, a cultural situation, and a political situation, and these folks would have had to deal with us on a much different level. And again, not because they had changed, but because the world had changed. They couldn't do the things they had done before, just go in and let lynchings happen, all that kind of stuff, you know, just right out large. Enough. They couldn't do that on the, like they had done before. That had changed. That made the situation where they, they had to be careful how they did that little dirty work. They couldn't do it so flagrantly like they had done before. I mean, we could have we could have been, we could have been, uh, uh, like like a, another group of people in this country. 
I ain't gonna name no names, but there's another group of people in this country who operate, have a very strong economic, political, and cultural base. And see, and what we neglect, we did it before. What we have neglected since Brother Man, we have, we have totally ignored as a group of people, we have totally ignored economics. We spend too much of our time dealing with electoral politics and practically never deal with economics. And the reality is, you will never. No matter where you are in the world, you will never have political power without economic power. You may have a limited degree of political influence, but you will never have political power without economic power. And if you have economic power, you automatically have political power. I tell the same thing to my, to my African colleagues. You can be all the independent you've claimed to be, but if you don't control your, your economy, you are not running your country. That's the bottom line. Brother Malcolm understood that. That's why part of in the OAU that one of the strength they, they was, was economic. Using our collective economic uh, uh, resources as a weapon. You know? And we don't have to. It, 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 not, when something happens, they, they unnecessarily. We don't have to be out there demonstrating and chanting. We go to some big economic entity in that community and say, listen, we know that we are so-and-so of your profits. You do something about what happened, that police thing have that happened. You do something about it, or we ain't buying nothing from you. And I'll bet you they'll, and they being the powerhouse in that town, they'll take care of that. We got to understand, man, economics. To this day, we spend all of our time just now focusing on electoral politics and practically none. You don't hear a single leader with any kind of national statute today that I know of. There is one somebody needs to let me know who talks about economics. Our collective economic. Everything is about electoral power. You can elect people till you turn blue in the face. If you don't have your economic resources grouped together, then at best you're going get, to get tokens. Malcolm was often critical of black leaders of the Christian faith, yet many of his supporters were of the Christian faith. How did you reconcile that? It was very easy. The OAAU was Brother Malcolm when he left the Nation of Islam. He formed two organizations, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, who stood for the people who were, were Muslims, who followed him. But he knew that there were other people out there who wanted to follow him or support him or work with him. And that's why he formed the OAAU. For those people like myself, who had no desire or intention to become Muslim, but who wanted to work with him. So he understood that. He didn't, uh, he didn't attack all Christians. He had some strong support among Christian leaders. There were, there were Christian leaders, man, Christian personalities and preachers and everybody who still supported Brother Malcolm. I, I heard about a meeting once. I was not there, but somebody I know who was there. And they had some big names there. And I'm not going to give them out. But that was some folks whose name you would be shocked to know that they were supporting Brother Malcolm on a very quiet level. You know? So so he he looked upon all of us, no matter what our religion, what our education background, we were, we were first of all, black folks. And as he said to us, when those people see us, they don't say, oh, he's a PhD, or he's a carpenter, or he's a this. They say he's a black person. Now, once they, they meet you, they may start making those distinctions. But when the first thing, they don't make all those distinctions. They, he's a black man. Or he's a, she's a black woman. They don't be talking about all those other things. Those other things come into play when they start saying, oh, we got we to gotta see if we can get this one with us. If the person has any kind of talent. You know, and we got to understand that, man. We got to stop being, being, stop dealing, looking for feel good moments in this country and start looking at hard, cold, hard notes, use of our economic, our collective economic resources, our collective. If you're a black person living in a million dollar house and, 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 and every house that black in the house in that community has a million dollars, if it's all black, 
is called the ghetto. Every house in there could cost a million dollars, but if it's all black, it's called the ghetto. And that's and we fall for that kind of stuff. Brown versus Board, when you think about it now, by saying that all black schools were inherently inferior, they were not inherently inferior. They were inferior because of the policies of the state and the attitude of the majority of society. But by accepting that, then it became all black businesses, all black professionals, all black anything was inferior. And so black folks start giving all of our money and everything to white folks. And we've been doing it for the, ever since Brown versus Board, we've been doing it. All right, now, I, I get a lot of criticism because, to me, I, I consider Brown versus Board now to have been a disaster for us. Mainly because of the way we did it, followed it. You had a thriving, in Richmond, Virginia, when I lived in Richmond, for they had a thriving black business area in Richmond. All hotel, bank, all kinds of things. But the minute Brown versus they ran across the street to the white folks. And we've been doing it ever since, except now we give it to not only just the white folks, but to Koreans and Chinese and you know, Indians and Arabs and everybody else but, but black folks. We better learn how to more effectively use our collective economic resources. After his separation from Elijah Muhammad's organization, what was Malcolm's vision of a Muslim organization in America apart from Elijah Muhammad? Did he aspire to lead such an organization? Well, he did lead such an organization. It was Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Muslim Mosque Incorporated was a more, I guess you would say, uh, more orthodox Muslim thing. And Brother Malcolm went to Mecca. You know, Brother Malcolm, he talked about that when he went to Mecca. And, 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 uh, and, and he, was, he was given recognition in the, in the Muslim world uh, uh, because of him, you know, him accepting the, you know, the, the basic tenets of Islam. Uh, and, and so he was, he, he was but, 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 but he was first of all a black man. Brother Malcolm was not going to be, Brother Malcolm was not going to let anything, he understood very clearly like, he taught us that your most important identification is that you're black. The others are like, you know, uh, you know, secondary. And to the position I have, to, I, to, I carry that to the day. To me, you can't be a Pan-Africanist Muslim, a Pan-Africanist Christian, a Pan-Africanist Ghanaian, a Pan-Africanist South African. You got to be a. I'm sorry. You cannot be a Muslim Pan-Africanist, a Christian Pan-Africanist, a, a, a Alabama Pan-Africanist, a North American Pan-Africanist, a European pan you got to be a Pan-Africanist Muslim, a Pan-Africanist Christian, a Pan-Africanist Ghanaian. Pan-Africanist has got to be the first identity. I truly believe that. And I, and I think that, that brother, that's what Brother Malcolm believes. And so that's why, uh, and, and I heard him say this, that, that he was first of all, you know, a black man. And, 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 and although he saw no conflict in that and being a, you know, a serious you know, Muslim. Okay, I just want to thank the people who made those questions. They were good questions. It gave me a chance to, to answer you know, some of the things I think you want to know. And uh, for those who are listening, if you have a question that you want to ask me, you may you know, send it to the, uh, to the uh, society, and uh, they will get it to me, and then we'll find a way to answer, the, uh, answer those questions for you. Uh, because we really want people to understand uh, both Pan-Africanism and we want people to understand Brother Malcolm. And what he was all about. We think this is critically important. So if you have questions in this area uh, that you would like to have answered, just, just send them to the society. And society will contact me and we'll find a way to answer those questions for you. And again, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for all of the pertinent questions. And once again, 
thank you, Professor Bailey, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. And thank you, the viewers, who thought it not robbery to spend time with us and learn a little bit more about Malcolm X and the struggle. Please be safe, God bless, and good evening. Good afternoon. My name is Edmund Pinto. I currently serve as the Chairman of the Board of Directors for the African American Cultural Society, Inc. We would like to thank you for your participation in our speaker series featuring A. Peter Bailey. We hope that you enjoyed it. And thanks to the AACS Black Studies Committee, the program participants, and the technical crew. A special thanks to Florida Humanities for funding a portion of our program programming through their community program grants. In the past, we have had many notable speakers, including but not limited to Congresswoman Val Demings, U.S. Ambassador Andrew Young, Howard Dotson, Chief of the Songbirds Center, and Lennox Lewis, Attorney for Nelson Mandela. In addition, we have annual cultural celebrations, investing in our youth with our annual Black History Youth Reality Program and scholarships. On behalf of the officers and the members, we take pride in bringing to you programs and trips of historical and cultural significance, and we appreciate your support. In closing, I extend to you an invitation to join us as a member, bringing with you your time, your talents, and resources to further the great work that we do here at the African American Cultural Society. May God bless you, and may God bless the African American Cultural Society Incorporated. Thank you. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, I'll, be, I'll say that be glory and majesty, dominion and power, henceforth and evermore. Within by your power and for your name's sake we pray. Amen.